in Ephesians chapter number 6 this evening. Ephesians chapter 6, we're winding up our series on higher ground. And uh, last week we spent uh, a good amount of time looking at uh, this passage of Scripture, looking at it in a different light than many times the word is focused on. But uh, we're dealing with this passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 6. We focused on verses 10, really through 17, as far as the message got, dealing with this passage of scripture that we often refer to as the armor of God. And uh, let's read the passages again. We'll read it from verse 10 all the way down to verse number uh, 20. Follow along, if you will, Ephesians 6, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to, be, to stand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the hammer of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, and therein I may speak boldly, as I ought to speak. Let's pray tonight. Father, we come to you tonight once again, praying that you would meet with us, for claiming your promise that where two or three are gathered, where you're there in the midst. Lord, I pray tonight that you would have freedom in our service, but we thank you tonight for the, the blessed privilege to come and sing hymns, to the praise and honor of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We thank you tonight that our souls have been saved because of the ministry of Community Baptist. We thank you for allowing us to be tools in your hand. We thank you tonight for, for Luke and Lord his courage to stand up and to unashamedly let everyone know he is Church of Christ as his Savior. We thank you tonight for the, the baptismal service the picture of your death, burial, and resurrection. Lord, tonight we come to this passage of Scripture, reminded of the spiritual battle that we're in. Lord, I pray that you would help us once again to understand the great danger that's involved, but also the great victory that we have. Lord, we love you, we thank you, give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we ask it all. Amen. Now, as we can come to the end of the book of Ephesians, we dealt with the heights over and over again. We talked about, you know, considering the heights, claiming the heights. Now we're, you know, now we're the, getting to the end, and we are conquering the heights because we have the high ground. Now, in Scripture, I want you to remember a verse where we are told to give no place to the devil. You understand what that means, right? Give no place. Don't give it to him. It's already ours. We already had the victory. And this passage of Scripture, did you notice how many times the word stand was used? He told us, uh, I don't have them circled, but verse 11 says that we'll be able to stand. Verse uh, 13, to withstand and to stand. Verse 14, to stand. You know, it's hard to fight a battle sitting down. Isn't it? Okay. We're supposed to be standing, and we're going to stand firm on the Word of God. And it's once again amazing how this passage of Scripture comes on the heels of really some controversial Scripture. When you talk about marriage and using the word submission, and talking about how you should behave on your job, people don't like those things, do they? And those passages of Scripture have really been manipulated to, to say things they don't really say. You're on the heels of that, and really, let's be honest, the difficulty of living in those areas, you know, me submit to him. You gotta be kidding. 
No, let's, let's be real. Or men, the fact that, you know, whether you want to or not, it's your responsibility to lead your family. Now, these are things we don't like to hear because sometimes we just, we're stubborn and hard-headed and just rebellious. And then to go on and tell me what I'm supposed to do at work, that's none of your business. These are difficult areas to live in, aren't they? These are areas that, that's where the rubber meets the road, right? You talk about being nice, about being kind, about loving each other. That's all general. That's all good. But now you start, well, you've got to do it here. Well, wait a minute, preacher. Well, you know, why has he got to bring that up? Well, that's what the Word of God says. But understand that these areas that Ephesians brings to our attention are not areas of contention. They're areas we've already been given victory in. Because we can do these things through Christ because Christ lives in us. They are victory ground. We have already gotten the victory. We're to give no place to the devil. We are to stand, not to back up, not to run. We're to stand because we have the victory ground. We have the high ground. As we talked about last week, we really emphasized, you know, there was three points last week. We only got to two of them. We'll finish the third one tonight. We talked about the fact that in this passage of Scripture, it emphasizes the fact that we are in a battle. So we talked about the adversary, who the adversary is. How he is carefully described, he's not flesh, he's not blood. Therefore, if he's not flesh and blood, as we get to the armor, we have to remember that the weapons that we use, the armor that we have, are not to be carnal, they're not to be temp- you know, temporal or, or fleshly. He's a spiritual being, therefore we must fight him with spiritual, in a spiritual warfare with spiritual weapons. He was carefully described, but he also, in verse number 10, remember, he's completely defeated because we're fighting in the power of his might, God's might. And Satan knows he's defeated. He was defeated at Calvary. When Jesus Christ rose from the grave, it was over. The battle is over. When he cried, it is finished, it wasn't it might be, or it's almost, it is finished. The battle's over. The devil has lost. We have won. Now, he hasn't surrendered yet. And that's why he fights like no one else. He has nothing to lose. And he's going to do as much damage between Calvary and the return of Christ as he possibly can do. Because he has nothing to lose. But praise God, he's already lost. He's completely defeated. And we have the victory by fighting in the power of the might of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We talked about the adversary. Then we talked about the armor. And we did that in a different way. We didn't look at every single piece. We've heard about those before. We emphasized how we're supposed to take on the armor of God as compared to, remember, we talked about David taking on the armor of Saul. It was unproved. We're to take on the armor of God and to prove it. We're to use it. It's the power of his might that we're fighting in. Not in our own intelligence, our own emotions, our own uh, motivational speeches. It's in the power of his might we're to fight. And we're to be selecting weapons of a spiritual nature, not the physical, carnal nature. And, of course, in our scripture, the only weapon that we're given is verse number 17. The sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And we were challenged last week by the simple thought, which was not original with me. I mentioned it last week. came from John Getch. Just the thought that, as he put it, you know, we have one weapon in our spiritual battle. And most of us have no idea where it is when we need it. That's why we need to hide it in our hearts so we're never without it. Our Bible is not our, not our good luck charm. And just because we carry it around doesn't mean the devil is not going to attack us. It doesn't mean we have to carry it around everywhere we go in physical form. But we should carry it around everywhere in our hearts. So when the devil attacks, we have a weapon. A weapon we can go to every time. When Jesus Christ was tempted of Satan, what weapon did he use? The Word of God. The sword of the Spirit. We need to follow his example. We talked about the fact that in the armor that there are uh, two, two items given to us. There is the shield and there is the sword both of which occupy one hand. So we can't be picking up. We, we, that's a great example. We can use it in a lot of ways. You know, we have the shield in one hand, 
and the sword in the other. We mentioned we can't pick up a burden. You know what else you can't pick up? Gossip. Sin. A lot of things you can't pick up. You've got bo- both hands busy, isn't there? There's a picture for us there. The shield of faith, utmost importance. The sword of the spirit, the only weapon we have. We must embrace them. And then when we do, it's amazing what we cannot pick up in life. Things that will be to our detriment. Make us vulnerable. Then we talked about, of course, the fiery darts. Uh, that's why we need the that's why we need this armor, the fiery darts of the devil. We talked to him about, about his wanting to pollute us, the fiery darts. The, the, sword, the, the shield is, a, is actually a wooden shield he's referring to because it quenches the fiery darts. And when it pierces into the wood, the fire is extinguished. Uh, the poison that's on, that was on the fiery darts, usually a little bottle of some kind, it is broken, dispensed, does not pollute us. And we talked about in our lives the two main gates by which pollution comes in. And we looked over at Second Peter chapter 2, looked at Lot's downfall. His downfall in First Second Peter chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, were seeing and hearing. Seeing and hearing. And we remember the passage in Genesis, don't we? When he was given the choice, either way he wanted. And the point Scripture makes is this. And he set his eyes towards Sodom. He saw. He looked. The eye gate then gave venue to open the ear gates. And he began to hear all the things that were going on in Sodom. How much fun they were having. Oh, it's so great. You have all, all these great amenities in life down in Sodom. Why are you living out in the middle of the, Why are you living out there in the middle of, middle of nowhere with a tent? Come on in the city. Man, we got malls. We got Walmarts. And we got all kinds of good things in here. It all sounded good, didn't it? And it drew him in because he opened his eye gates and his ear gates and let Satan use them. We must guard them. And we made this statement. You know, we need to close the gate or suffer the fate. Those are two avenues the devil uses all the time in our lives, bringing before us things that we should not see, things that we should not hear. We need to close them or suffer the fate. Then we come to this last point, which we didn't get to last week. And it's talking about the adversary, talking about our armor. Look at the attack. Follow with me again as I read verse 17 and 18. Notice, he says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The sentence continues, praying always with our prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, the utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Notice that's all one sentence. It's one thought. He says, take on the helmet and the sword. And while you're doing that, praying with all prayer and supplication. Notice, this is our means of attack. We have an armor. We have a shield. We have a weapon. How do we attack? Praying always. You know, we hear the the comical expression, you know, charging hell with a water pistol. I wouldn't advise you to charge hell with a water pistol. In fact, even in our passage, what was the word we saw over and over again? Was it charge? Stand. Stand. Does that mean I can take ground? Yeah, I can, but God's primarily concerned with stand. Don't. We're figuring it out, I promise. We know where the problem lies. We're just trying to get the details. But we're to stand. We're to give no ground. And notice in standing, he tells us, praying always with all prayer and supplication. And what we're going to look at tonight is this attack, the attack in prayer. Because we're, remember, we're fighting in the power of his might. We have this weapon, we have this shield, we have this armor, 
but it's a spiritual battle that we're fighting. We must fight it in his might. And our primary engagement is that of prayer. So in the attack, we're going to see five quick things tonight about, about the attack. The attack is prayer. Notice, first of all, praying always. Praying always. Meaning the attack, we need to pray frequently. Pray frequently. When you're on your knees in prayer, literally or figuratively, when you're in prayer mode, have you noticed how hard it is to sin when you're in prayer mode? Now, no doubt, if we're honest, we would admit that there have been times that we've been praying and the thought should not have popped in our mind. And we shouldn't have been dwelling on it. But hopefully in our prayer mode, we quickly realize it and ask God to forgive us. But you know, it's, it's difficult to fall into sin. It's difficult to give ground to Satan when we're on our knees praying, talking to the captain, the general, the Lord of the Lord's host. When we're in communion with him, it's very difficult for Satan to break in and for us to give him ground because we're in the state of praying. So if we understand that bringing a, a sense or mode of prayer fortifies us, challenges us not to give ground to Satan, then wouldn't it make sense if that is the case, we should spend more time in prayer? I know Last year on Wednesday evenings, we spent a good deal of Wednesday evenings talking about prayer. We're not going to do that all over again. You can go back and look at your notes. But it's amazing how in Scripture so many times the answer to our problem is prayer. Yet how in our minds we don't see prayer as the answer to the problem. And, and in all honesty, we've used it and used it in such a way as just to blow it off. Oh, I'll pray about it. And it's, it's flippant. I'll pray for you. And it's flippant. But you understand the scripture, that is not the case. But if, if you look at scripture, if I, let's, let's use an example real quick. Now let's, let's be honest, we're in church, right? Okay? God say where two or three are gathered in his name, he's in the midst, right? I can't count real high, but there's more than two or three here. So he's here, Right? He's here. So how many of us, at times, some of us may be more so than others, we battle with the sin of worry? Okay? Turn with me. There's a few pages in your Bible. How are we going to overcome the sin of worry? Some of us love to worry, don't we? We can't, we can't wait to worry about something else. We're worrying about what we're going to worry about next. In Ephesians, or Philippians chapter 4, notice this. Be careful. The word careful there is full of care, or what we would say today, anxious. It's not careful as in tiptoeing, make sure you don't hurt yourself. It's careful as in full of care, being anxious, worry. Okay? Be anxious, worry. For, you get the idea. Be careful for nothing. Well, that's easier said than done, Lord. Yes. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Notice he addresses here specifically how you overcome worry. How do you do it? Instead of worrying, what does he say do? Pray. And there is he gives some specific instructions about that prayer. And supplication with thanksgiving. So in our thanksgiving, we'll be counting our blessings rather than all our worries, right? So we'll be counting our blessing. We're letting our request be know, made known to God. You know, tell them what you're worried about, but count your blessings. Praise the Lord for this. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. And guess what's going to happen as you're praying, giving God thanks? What's he say is going to happen? 
The worry leaves, and what comes in the place of it? The peace of God. The peace of God. And this formula is seen over and over and over in Scripture, if you'll look for it, about prayer. Prayer is a huge, huge benefit in the Christian life if we simply will use it the way God intended it. He says, praying always. We're to pray frequently. And then notice, not only we pray frequently, but pray fully. With all prayer and supplication. You ever thought about that? How do you pray with all prayer? Seems kind of redundant, doesn't it? Pray with all prayer and supplication. Pray. Miss Jane, why don't you come preach and explain that for us? How do you pray with all prayer? No, I'm, not, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But you thought about that? Pray with all prayer. Sounds catchy. But what does it mean? You understand there are different types of prayers, right? And Scripture speaks of those. In our spiritual battle, we are to pray with all prayer. Prayers of confession. Prayers of thanksgiving. Prayers of supplication. Prayers of intercession. All these kinds of prayers are to be incorporated in our prayer life. There's different types of prayers for different types of situations. He says, basically, pray all kinds of prayers in our spiritual battle. There may be some, you're in the midst of the battle, and you need to pray this type of prayer. Pray it. But at the same time, pray all types of prayers. You're in the battle. Something's going on. And you realize, this is my fault. Well, what prayer should you pray? A prayer of confession. I brought this on myself. Lord, forgive me. It could be a prayer of humility. Lord, I'm in this mess, and you may not have brought it on yourself. But Lord, I am in this, and I don't know how to handle it, and I'm praying a prayer of humility. I'm here, and I don't know what to do. Help me to understand. Help me to see. It could be in the midst of the spiritual battle. We find out somebody else is in the same battle. Now we pray a prayer of intercession. Praying all prayers. Pray with all prayers and supplication. So that's what it means to pray with all prayers. All types of prayers are to be incorporated. And I believe it's a good practice for a Christian that any time they pray, to incorporate every type of prayer possible in that prayer. Now, there are times, of course, you know, call me non-spiritual if you want to, but tonight when we go back to birthday night, I'm not going to incorporate all kinds of prayers in the prayer for the food. But there should be a prayer of thanksgiving, shouldn't there? Prayer of gratitude. Prayer of asking blessing. But in my personal life, when I have my devotion time, when I set some time, some time aside just for me to pray, that ought to be the time that I'm praying with all prayer and supplication. I should make it a practice in that prayer life. That time of confession. Just come before God. Things that I know are wrong, confess them. But also just, Lord, Show me, remind me, so that I can ask for forgiveness and get, get it right now. Have prayers of thanksgiving, praising God for who he is. Having prayers of intercession, praying for others that are on our prayer list, for example. My prayer life should incorporate all manners and types of prayer. Pray with all prayer and supplication. Prayers of confession, prayers of worship, prayers of intercession, prayers of petition, prayers of thanksgiving. So we're praying always, verse 18, with all prayer and supplication. And notice... In the Spirit. You see, we pray frequently, we pray fully, but then we pray fervently. Fervently. Because I'm praying in the Spirit. Remember, I have on the armor of God. I'm fighting in the power of His might, and when I pray, I need to pray in His Spirit. It reminds us of every aspect. It's spiritual. There's a big difference between praying and saying prayers. You understand that? There's a big, big difference between praying and saying prayers. Many of us, when we were brought up as little kids, we were taught to say prayers. And it was a method to teach us how to pray. But hopefully there's become sometime in our life a transition where we stopped praying or saying prayers and started praying. There's a huge difference. 
We're to pray fervently. James tells us the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We're to pray fervently. Pray in the Spirit. In the Spirit, not our Spirit, in the Spirit of God. So we're on the attack. We pray frequently. We pray fully. We pray fervently. And notice, it says, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. There is we pray frequently, we pray fully, we pray fervently, and now we pray faithfully. We pray faithfully and watching. Now remember, where is the scene set before us? We have on armor, so we're sitting at the theater, right? What's the scene? We're, we're in armor, so what's the scene? A battle scene. And in part of that battle, notice he tells us to watch. To watch. There is a sentry on duty, is there not? Now, many military folks here, you have duty every so often, right? Or had duty. You're up 24 hours waiting for some knucklehead to screw up and do something, so you got a phone call, right? Now, you weren't necessarily in a battle scene, but you were on duty watching out for your men. But the same thing is true in the battlefield. Just because the night falls doesn't mean the battle's over. There's somebody who has to watch. There must be a sentry on duty. When everyone else falls asleep, they're putting their life in the sentry's hands. I'm trying to remember a story. It brought it to my mind, but it didn't bring it to me fully. I can't remember if I was listening to a message or reading it about an individual he wanted to join the army, finally was able to join it. I think it was during the Civil War. And then on his first watch as a private, he fell asleep. Now this was back in the day, way back in the day. And it was, a, it was an act of treason. And he was convicted. But the president pardoned him. And after he was pardoned, man, he served like no other soldier. He was actually died in battle, retrieving soldiers from battle. He was shot while retrieving soldiers from the battlefield. We don't need to fall asleep on duty. It's a serious obligation. We need to be faithful, watching with all perseverance and supplication. For who? For all the other saints who are in the battle. We need to be careful. We need to be vigilant. Because the devil is seeking to devour and if he can't get you, he will set up for anybody he can get his jaws on. Pray faithfully. Now notice, we're talking about prayer, not meddling. Praying faithfully for everyone who's in the battle with us. We don't need to skip on our prayer time. We don't need to skimp on our prayer time. It's where we're actively engaged in the battle. So we pray frequently, we pray fully, we pray fervently, we pray faithfully. And then notice as he's talking about prayer, we need to pray factually. Factually. As he mentions prayer, praying always with all prayer and supplication. Notice he says in verse 19, and for me. Pray for all saints and pray for me. And w well, Paul, that's great. I'll pray for you. But wait a minute, I didn't tell you what to pray for yet. I want you to pray for these specifics. That utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds. Remember, he's in prison. That therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We need to pray factually. We need to pray specifics. We need to pray for one another and for ourselves, like Paul, that we will be given utterance to speak boldly. There's a comma there, not a period. To speak boldly concerning what? The mystery of the gospel. That we'll be the ambassador God's called us to be. We need to pray factually. And I believe out of this passage right here, we need to pray that we and others around us, other brothers and sisters in Christ, would be the soul winner God has us to be.
to speak boldly. We can become very timid. We can become very timid about the gospel. The gospel is the power of God and salvation. We need to pray for one another because we are in a spiritual battle. So tonight as we get ready to close the book, we may say a few closing comments next week about the, uh, his benediction. We need to understand we have the victory and the way to conquer, to take on the armor, use the sword of the Spirit, and most importantly, pray. It's our means of attack. Pray. Pray in the Spirit. Take on the armor of God, the sword of the Spirit, and pray in the Spirit. Let's pray tonight. Father, we come to you once again thanking you for your many, many blessings. Lord, we are in a spiritual battle. And yes, we've been given a shield, we've been given a helmet, we've been given uh, a belt of truth, we've been given many things. But we focused on tonight, there's a couple of verses that deal with the attack. But we must spend time in prayer. We must pray with all prayer and supplication. We must be faithful. We must be factual. We must be fervent. Lord, prayer, you've designed prayer to be such an integral part of our life. Lord, you have told us how you answer prayer. Lord, help us to understand, Lord, prayer isn't just something we offer up flippantly. It's not a word we use to say, oh, I'll pray for you. Uh, Lord, what it really means, we'll think about it. We'll think about it at some point in time. But many times we never actually get on our knees and actually speak to you about that person's need. Lord, I pray we understand the power behind prayer. Help us understand it is so important in our lives. Lord, it is so important. It helps us to stand, not to retreat, not to lose ground. Lord, I pray that tonight we would be committed more than ever to be faithful in our prayer lives. We love you because you loved us first. We give you all honor and all glory. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed tonight, Miss Jane will begin to play as she does. If you would stand to your feet tonight, just the altar's open. Maybe tonight you'd realize that you know, prayer isn't the integral part of your life that it needs to be. Maybe tonight you want to come and just commit yourself to be a prayer warrior. As you begin praying every day. Begin praying for not only yourself, but for all saints. Watching one another. Because we're all in a spiritual battle together. However God's leading tonight, I trust that you'll respond in a way that is appropriate. You come as she plays.